I would like to call our next speaker, Mr. Louis Your Awful, Executive Director, AFC FTA Policy Network, Chairman of Executive Council, APN Woman of Africa Network, CEO, Lobby Enterprise. He was the first district coordinator and acting deputy regional coordinator of Ministry of Women and Children in Ghana. And the topic he will share his knowledge is creating a future-proof business. Over to Mr. Lewis. Yes, good morning and good morning to your participants. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, to just, uh, I couldn't do PowerPoint because of some little miscommunication about my time difference. So uh, I think I'll be able to do my presentation uh, orally. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be part of this uh, program. I think that uh, it's important we situate how to create uh, a future-proof uh, uh, business. So, as I said, uh, you have um, you have uh, uh, the topic that has to do with uh, creating a future-proof business, and uh, I'm saying that it's important we situate it in the context that we find ourselves in this era. And I would like to look at the phase that had to do with having a, a succession plan for us who have a, a, have a future proof business. There is a need to have a succession plan, no matter the type of business or the type of markets that you find yourself. For example, if you look at most parts of Africa, uh, a lot of businesses are private owned businesses which are very, very good, all right? But if you look at the governance system, uh, most of them don't have a succession plan. You need to have a succession plan, management succession plan, where you say that in the next 10 years, when you, the founder or the group founder, steps down, who are the people professionally who are going to take care of or take over this business? Most of the time, because of lack of succession, a lot of well-established businesses collapse because then they don't have any plan as to succession. They don't have any plans to uh, succession which affects the budgeting, which affects uh, MOUs and partnerships. Of other. They can't, there is no continuity. And so it's very, very important to really look at a review the existing succession plans. And if there is none, create one that will meet the times so that the business can be protected in the future. We should take the examples of the Coca-Colas. We should take examples of the Fords. They have had successive plans, management successive plans, which to today we are still having. I don't know which country have not tasted Coca-Cola. <laughs> and and, and that, is, that is it. I don't know which country have not tasted Coca-Cola. Everyone, at least, every country might have seen the bottle of Coca-Cola. How did it happen? They had, but today, do and there have been successions. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that we need to, the second area that I want us to look at in order to create a future-proof business is to look at what we call you, your peer versus your competitive options. Your peer versus your competitive options. And by this, are you in business because of the people that are around you that you are competing with? or you are in the business because of the competitive nature of the business. If you are in business because you have to satisfy uh, the expectations of some individuals or your peers or some friends, or then you, 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 are, you, are, you, are, you are the wrong place. Because at the end of the day, you are just going to do exactly what they're expecting you to do. That recourse to the competitive structure of the industry. And that is very, very important because in the future, competition is going to grow. I remember the product Pepsi Cola, Pepsi and Coca Cola. Coca Cola is so standing strong, it's still vibrant. I don't see much of that of Pepsi Cola. So the question is that if I'm a business owner, maybe I felt maybe, oh, Coca Cola is doing what I want to come up with a product like that. That is good. 
but is is the option is the focus because there is a product that you want to break it from or because you are well prepared for the competitive nature of the industry and so as you're going into business in the future we have a business that will last you need to really calculate the competitive nature of the industry and not because it's a peer not because you feel like you can compete by because someone is in or oh, and, and it, it, it it's amazes me sometimes we come to Ghana sometimes you see somebody establish a business a particular type of venture and by the time you realize about 100 people are in it and when that industry begins to go down almost everybody goes down and so you can count some kind of businesses that started 10 years ago they are no more why was it based on peer oh everybody is doing and i think i can do it or it was based upon the the competitive nature of the industry in the future today those kind of businesses that came like a kind of mushroom because we're based on PA, most of them don't, don't, don't exist. So we need to look at our competitive nature of the industry versus the PA reason why you establish the business. And if we are going to have it to be fully established and be able to stand the proof of time, then we need to go into the competitive nature and prepare the competitive pillars that we need for our business to try. A critical area that I also want to touch on has to do with that. You have to really involve, and it, 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 it is not even a point that should even leave a technology. For you to create a future, future proof business, you will really have to prepare to invest in technology. Because you and I know it, I cannot, it's, it's an estimate, you can't underestimate the power of technology. But here, technology should be what I call appropriate technology. What appropriate technology have you envisaged for your business to survive in the future? I don't remember, madam, the last time you posted a letter, you went to the post office. <laughs> I don't remember. Because why? Now you can send your messages through WhatsApp, through every so many means within a short of time. So now you've wiped out a post office, maybe you in hard, uh, no, you're receiving certain hard packages and what, but one of the days when you have to trek to the post office, one of those days when you have to trek to go and do uh, telegram and telefax and faxing all those. Today, it's as easy, you can use your smartphone to do all these complex, and that is the beauty of technology. So it should not just be technology, but it should be appropriate technology. So for your future business to be really survive the proof of time, you must develop appropriate technology, not just technology, but appropriate technology. I don't know whether there'll come a time that telecoms are no, telecoms are not going to work again because that is an appropriate technology. How could we engage people to communicate to each other? How do we come with the same cars? Huh? These are inelastic products or services that at the end of the day is appropriate to the needs of times. And no matter how time changes, technology becomes constant. It is very, very important. Appropriate technology is, is, is something that we have to look. As I was asking you, the last time you, 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 did, you went to the post office to post, it's the same way. I'm not sure the last time you went to the bank physically, maybe to deposit or to do a drawer. Why? Because at the end of the day, the appropriate technology of where you can do all your trans banking transactions are on your phone through AI systems and through robotics and what have you. So my third emphasis will be on appropriate technology, not just technology, in having a future-proof business. My last point I want to really emphasize, which is very, very key, has to do with the uh, what I call you must develop the art of business models the art of business models and this a lot of people really practice what they were trained at the universities or polytechnic good that is fine but it is not the same when you come to the art of how it plays in an industry and it is how you play or it's how you design your art that will give you the urge i remember a friend of mine some time ago went for a program and when he went for the program an interview uh, the interview, everybody was having a, a white sheet of paper. And then he decided to use 
a yellow sheet of paper. And so he was asked, why are you using the yellow sheet of paper? Then he said, I want to be unique. And that got him the job. You realize, you see, at the end of the day, everybody is going for interview, but he decided to choose the art, a spe specialized art of doing it. You can be having a business, maybe you can belong to the telecom industry, but what is the art of your, the design art of how you want your business to look like and to play? Are you going to go the way everybody does? It? For example, when you take a customer experience, how is your customer experience going to play? Is it the normal one that is known to everybody? So the art of the job is very important. Even the people you employ, you have to take them through this design art of the work. It is different from what you are taught in the university, different from what you are taught at the polytechnic. It's different from where you were, but it is a, it's a kind of model that suits your service and your product, and that will bring a lasting resort to your competitors or to your, your clients. So we need to have the art of the work. And that is why sometimes it's very difficult that sometimes you, you, you hear some graduates say, look, I, I, I don't feel happy on my job. Sometimes it's not because they are not paying them well, but because they don't, their skills doesn't match with the art of the work or the art of the business. And so I think that when we are able to deploy all these four items I've expanded, you, you, you can really have a business that will last into generations, transgenerational, because it, is, it becomes unique to you. It becomes fresh to the clients. It doesn't become stale. Do you, uh, you and I right now, we're using the Zoom. A time will come. How are we going to structure our meetings is very, very important. How are we going to have it different from the, the way it is ever done anywhere? Today, Zoom is about to lay off some people. Why? Because maybe Zoom was taking, looking at a pandemic situation. Could Zoom come out of something beyond the pandemic situation? I'm sure they might be thinking about it. And on that note, I want to thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, I would like to ask a few questions. Uh, please explain a uh, few mm -hmm. business opportunities in Ghana. What are the business opportunities in Ghana? Ghana, agribusiness, you have a lot of opportunity in agribusiness, especially when you're building value chain. And because the National Export Development Organization, uh, the National Export Goal or Vision has expanded a lot of exportable crops which becomes cash crops beyond cocoa, cashew. Now cashew is very important. Coffee, we knew so coffee was there, but cashew, uh, shea butter, these are very, very important. Coconuts. So the agribusiness and agri-processing, very, very much big opportunity. Again, in the area of ICT, ICT is really, really growing alarming at alarming rates, you know, to invest either in hardware or in service, which is also very, very, very important. Another area which is, is very important that is an open opportunity of business in Ghana is fintechs. You know, fintechs are also growing very, very much because, and, and we have uh, ZPay, we have uh, products like ZPay, and, 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 and we had one of, our, uh, one of Africa's foremost internet experts who happened to be from Ghana. So fintechs, ICT, agribusiness and agri-process, food processing, is really, really dominant in Ghana. Another critical area of business that is also dominant in Ghana is the area of, 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 of garment and textiles. It is key because we have even a national policy where every Friday you're supposed to wear your, uh, your indigenous cloth. And so garment and textile is also really doing uh, uh, extremely well. Last but not the least, another industry that is also doing very well when it comes to business in Ghana is the creative industry. It, if it needs the necessary push, it can earn a lot. If you look at some of our programs we did regard to the year of return, which was connected to tourism. So by extension, I'm looking at tourism, but creative industry really, really fetches a lot for a lot of, uh, of, of revenue. Why? Because the value chain is very, very wide and long. And people fit into it as as, as it keeps uh, you know expanding. So these business sectors are very very dominant in Ghana. And then you're looking at pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals is also a very very big opportunity 
an area for, for anyone who would like to invest or do business in Ghana. Okay, thank you. My next question will be, some of the key government policies to promote local business in Ghana? Well, the key among them is one government policy what we have is a PPP, Private Partnership you know, uh, Participation Act. This was an act that was enacted by parliament. So the governments can have partnership with the private sector. And so one policy that government want to look at is what we call the, the uh, uh, 1D, 1F, one district, one factory. In other words, if you take Ghana's districts, government's aim was that you would like to have a, a factory based upon the raw materials available. And this, he was going to do it with private sector companies. Government was not going to do it alone. So if I have my plan, I have my business plan as a government, I, I want to partner you so that we can build a factory on, uh, uh, within a sugar free, a sugar cane, uh, um, districts or mango district fruits. That is a very, very good initiative that government uh, 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 policy, uh, which I think is, is, is also very, very important. Then also the policy of uh, looking at uh, the uh, all agencies, government agencies, whatever, should wear uh, our African way on Fridays. That promotes local content that promotes local content. Because at the end of the day, you know that uh, at least if the whole Friday, every Friday, uh, the attention of uh, our purchasing, uh, uh, and, and I would like to use India, for example, after your independence, you, you came up with your own designed garment and clothing industry. It wasn't easy initially, but today you're exporting more. So that was the concept, the concept of let's wear what we, 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 we design, what we, we sold. Let's wear our own indigenous uh, garment or clothing textiles. And that promotes the local companies and, and it shifts them away from a lot of undue competition from outside. Okay, thank you. My next question is, uh, how emerging technologies evolving in Africa? I think if, we, uh, if I go back to my earlier point, technology is fast evolving. Now, a lot of us are waking up to uh, the AI and robotics. A lot of Africans have taken seriousness to STEM projects. STEM education is really ongoing. So you take STEM education, you take robotics, AI, you take blockchain, you take uh, even metaverse. All these are, and then you talk 3D works, all these are changing various facets of industry, especially if you take uh, the health sector. You know, there, um, um, this, it's very difficult these days. You said a lot of e e pharmacology or e pharmacy or e e e, e, e yes e pharmacy. Uh, those days, uh, sometimes you have to really work directly to the pharmacies for prescription. A lot of technology has evolved. Where it's bringing the pharmacies closer to the doorsteps of the of, of the of the uh, of the client or the patient. Again, you look at the banking industry. Technology has really evolved. I tell you honestly, going to those days, you have to go there and send physical cash to the branch, the banking hall. Now you can walk to one ATM with your hard cash, slot it inside, and you still have the same services. Even even all, almost all media where we, we, we accrue ourselves to media news, television, are all on apps. If you didn't watch a show, it's not like those days when you say, oh my God, today you have apps that you can go back to the, uh, the, the program that you missed. And I think it's changing the way we have the human to human contact and to rather more of focusing on, uh, on these technological products and technological services. So it's, it's really evolving in the area of banking, in the area of health, in the area of education, and also in the area of uh, transport and logistics and aviation as well. Thank you so much, Mr. Lewis, for your answer and your time. Thank you. My pleasure, and I wish you all well. Uh, so I need to ask one question. Uh, you are one of the renowned AFCTA policy experts. Will you please highlight few key policies, agendas of Africa free trade agreement? 
the African continental free trade has the vision of one African market. And so the free trade is actually to boost intra-African trade, is to reduce our trade with the rest of the world by trading among ourselves. And so one of the target is to make sure that we add value to our raw materials. And so its focus is more on tariff reduction, duty reduction. How do we do it? By liberalizing about 90% of our products and keep seven and 3% to help local industry. So countries are supposed to liberalize based on preferences. For example, what schedule did you, did you submit? Your schedules of commitment is very important. So West Africa, the regional blocks went with one schedule, other regions went to one schedule. What that, what that place is that? Any product that is not manufactured from Africa will attract duty. Any product that meets the rules of origin in terms of uh, wholly made, uh, partial, or uh, value addition, whatever it is, we need to have an originating status for the product so that you can attract duty reduction. And once you have duty reduction, it enables your export cost to reduce and you can export and expand your business. So the AMA, the aim of the African continental between is to create a big revenue market for the African people so that we can be able to be innovative based upon our comparative advantage. Why will Ghana import wheat from outside Africa when Nigeria can do it? Why will Nigeria import salt from outside Africa when Ghana can do it? That comparative advantage is what the ASCFT agreement seeks to not only in the area of goods, but in the area of services. What offer can I give? Can I give tourism and you in turn give me uh, transport? Can I give out a uh, health side and you give to return telecommunication? So goods and services have been carefully negotiated said that the barriers are removed, technical barriers are removed, and then duties are given and reduce counted or reduce rate per what each member state offered. Thank you. Uh, one more question. One Europe and one Africa market is gaining higher attention across the world. How both continents collaborating to promote international trade? If I understand your question, how is Africa Collaborating with international on international trade. Yes, one Europe and yes, correct. <laughs> well, I think that Africa needs to continue to believe in African continental free trade because we have our own market. Then it gives opportunity to startups. We will continue to trade with Europe. However, we should be mindful of partnership agreements that will that will. Will, will slow the implementation of the ASCFT. We should go into a partnership agreement with the rest of the world on input-based products. What inputs, what we cannot produce yet to help our industrialization agenda. We should not import things we can produce here in Africa. That will not help with the agreement and that will not make us industrialized. We can do importation of industrial inputs so that we can work on it and come out with our own. And I keep always using India that is today you manufacture everything. So I think that with the rest of the world, we should look for uh, input-based importation and partnership agreements that will respect the, the trade, uh, fair trade. This is the way I think that Africa needs to trade with the rest of the world. Thank you, thank you for the answer. Let's see if we get any more questions. Okay, uh, Pan Africa e commerce policy, if any, if there are any e commerce policy in Pan Africa. Yeah, I think the African continental free trade in the next phases to come will engage in what we call the digital trade. It replaces the name e commerce. So, very soon there will be a protocol of, within the agreement called e digital trade. So, yes. It's okay. in phases now, yeah, it's still under a negotiation, it's a discussion level. Eventually, it will be part of the agreement. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lewis, for your great answer and your great time. Thank you so much.